I want to start by saying that um, I don't usually use the word cartography, but my friend Steve Kelly is in the Glen County Jail right now, and they only give him tiny little postcards and stubby little pencils to write. And he's in prison because he was one of seven very devout Catholics, actually, who uh, were not kneeling on their knuckles on the bathroom floor. They were busy trying to figure out for the past year how they might best express their own collective strong opposition to our readiness to prepare the end of the world. And in the Kings Bay, Georgian Naval Trident submarine base, essentially the Trident submarines that go along the southern Georgia coast each carry enough explosive power to, if they were used, occasion 1,825 Hiroshima-sized atomic blasts. Imagine. I mean, the math is pretty incredible, isn't it? when you think of how many people were killed in Hiroshima. And so my friends went into that Trident submarine base, and they did very minimal damage, really. They whacked on a, a replica of a D-5 missile. They set up crime scene tape. They hung banners. But they faced years and years and years in prison. And so that's why some of us were walking 115 miles down the coastland of southern Georgia. But Steve Kelly, a Jesuit priest from his prison cell inside the Glynn County Jail, writes to me, Kathy Kelly, no relation, and calls me Kathy of Kellydom. And I'm pretty sure that Steve in his cartography doesn't really adhere to imperial states and borders and maps. He really is thinking about Kellydom and the reign of the various different people that he believes are the heart and soul of what could be a future for our world today. So I know that's a kind of an odd way to understand cartography. But Dan was so great in agreeing that we could start out tonight by taking a look at several of the maps that give an impression of some of what I want to talk about. I would like so much to be able to talk with you tonight about children and about ordinary people that I've had a very, very blessed chance to meet with in Afghanistan and in Iraq and in Yemen. And I'd like to know first, do we have anyone here with us tonight who's, who was born in Afghanistan or is from Afghanistan? Or perhaps Iraq or Yemen? Oh, well, we'll have to try harder in the future because we really need to hear from those voices, but I'll beg your indulgence and try to kind of bring what I can from those places. But anyway, here we have the, the map that to me is um, so full of interest, but could you notice that Pakistan and Iran kind of enclose Afghanistan, that landlocked country. And look at that long border between Pakistan and Iran. And Pakistan is a nuclear armed country. Iran uh, is accused of trying to become such could we, could we notice a little tiny Djibouti over here? It's like a thumb. And that's where the big, huge United States military base, Camp Le Meunier, is located. And then also the Chinese are building a big, huge military base there. So you can imagine the prices are going up, 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 because there are um, so many new fast food places and roads and hotels. But it's also the place where desperate, desperate people have come over from South Sudan, from Ethiopia, from Eritrea, from Somalia, they're desperate to get somewhere and they think, oh, maybe we'll get up that Saudi coast and we'll get to someplace better. And so they cross over that teeny little Baba Mandab, the, the, the gate of tears, they call it. And I would like to talk a little bit more about that further. And then Iraq, another almost landlocked country, except for just at the tip down there, you have the city of Basra and then leading into Kuwait. And um, Oh, we used to call Jordan the Hashemite kingdom of boredom. And you never saw people so happy to be bored as those of us who crossed out of Iraq after being there during a bombing or out of Gaza. Do you see, um, oh my goodness, uh, Gaza is mentioned and the West Bank is mentioned up there in the country of Israel. So part of my street cred, if you will, is that I'm, I'm an ex-con. 
I, I did one year in maximum security prison for the mm -mm, crime of planting corn on top of nuclear missile silo sites. I don't know why I don't go out and do it more often. Um, I did four months for trying to, um, well, I was supposed to do four months. They let me out early that time, but trying to deliver a loaf of bread to a, a, um, an officer commanding Whiteman Air Force Base, and then three months for uh, crossing the line at Fort Benning. But I do want to say, if any of you know anybody in the United States Armed Forces coming back from a war zone or from a base or from training, arms open. Arms open, welcome people back, bring them home, bring them home, bring them home. Thank you. Um, so uh, that, that's a little bit of the cartography, and Dan's got two other maps. Um, but I would like now to just go quickly to saying that um, most of my life, what I was sort of prepped for wasn't something that could give me a whole lot of insight into what I encountered when I was in war zones like Afghanistan or Iraq or Gaza. And so I'd like to tell you that, I mean, when I was a kid, people went to high school and then they went to college. We just sort of took that for granted. And it wasn't such a big deal that you went off to college. But in Afghanistan, if somebody gets into university, that's a very big deal. And if they got into the university by dint of their own abilities and not somebody paying money under the table, well, that's another big deal. And so for the Namakti family, they had two youngsters in university. They were so enormously proud. And during the time of Ramadan, if you can get back with your family, you do it. And so Ismail Namati and his brother Adidullah were walking a long distance after they'd been dropped off by a bus, and they were going back to be with their family members. And who knew that the night before, some Taliban fighters walking along that same road had knocked on the Namati family door. And in that code, in that part of the world, if somebody knocks on your door and asks for food or water and they've walked a long way, you don't really say, well, 7-Eleven is over there or motel, there is no 7-Eleven, there is no, if you can, if you've got something to share, you do. And so the Namati family shared with the two people that were strangers that knocked on the door. And they must have been picked up by our very, very sophisticated surveillance systems because, you know, the drones are always flying over and they follow Taliban fighters. They sometimes call them high-value targets. And so when the two Namati brothers knock on the same door, of course the people analyzing the screen have reason to think here are two more high-value targets. And so the Namachi brothers have dinner with the family, and the youngest brother, Ishmael, said that he was so excited that even though his brothers just wanted to study, he wanted to go in and be in the same room where his brothers were studying. And they, they fell asleep over their books, and he fell asleep, and then all of a sudden the night raid began. And the United States military people who are so well trained, they're some of the most professional warriors in the world, kicked in the door, and they went right for the room where the boys were. And Ishmael said that his a brother, Ismail, had awakened and was trying to say, he spoke some English, he was trying to say, no, we're students, we're students, but it was perceived as a struggle and the gunshots rang out. And there were three pools of blood for Ismail, for Adi Duma and for their other brother, whose name I'm sorry, I don't recall. And the little guy, Ishmael, went running to see what was happening to his oldest brother. And already there were bags over the heads of his father and the older brother. And the interpreter, the Afghan interpreter, was walloping this guy on one side of that and on the other. Tell the truth. Where are the guns? Where are the guns? And then finally the older brother said, believe me, if you find any guns in this house, you can come and shoot me with them. And then the truth came out. And you can imagine the horror and the sorrow and the dismay all around as they began to realize that this town 
had celebrated those two boys. This family had been so proud of those two boys. And an apology was issued. An apology, a heartfelt apology, was issued from the United States military. But my friends, I have read that apology again and again and again and again. And my friends, I'm afraid there's been something like a green light with those apologies that now the Saudis have picked up and they do something similar. The United States bombed a hospital in Kunduz, Afghanistan, the Médecins Sans Frontières Hospital, for an hour and 15 minutes, even after the reports have been called in from the Afghans uh, inside the hospital to say, you're bombing a hospital to NATO, to the UN, to the United States, to the Afghan military. Please, you're bombing a hospital. And a C-130 transport outfitted with Gatling guns and Bofors cannons flew away and came back and bombed again. 15 minute intervals, flew away and came back and bombed again. 15 minutes, flew, came back and bombed again. I knew about it because of a young pharmacist, Khaled Ahmed, who worked in the hospital. And he had run upstairs when he heard the explosion with the chief pharmacist. What's happening? You know, this nightmare of the intensive care unit and the emergency room being directly bombed. And so the security people said, look, we don't really know what to tell you. We don't know what's going on. But man, take your cell phone out of your bag because, you know, these planes, there have got to be U.S. planes. They can pick up signals from your cell phone. Disable your cell phone. Do it now. They did that. And then they said, now you've just got to run. So the chief pharmacist ran first, and he made it to the gate, and he made it outside the gate. And then they said to Khaled, OK, man, you got to run. And Khaled's heart is hammering. And he goes, he runs as fast as he can. He gets one foot outside the gate, and that's when he took shrapnel in the back. And he fell into a ditch, and he was bleeding so profusely that he realized he might die. In an Afghan tradition, if you know you're going to die, you try to talk with your father and say you're sorry. You're sorry for anything you ever did to hurt the family or to hurt him. But Ahmed had already disabled his cell phone, and one arm is paralyzed, and his back is getting more and more squishy with the bloodshed. So he manages with one arm to put the cell phone back together again, dials home, reaches his mother, and says, Mom, I have to talk to Dad. But the mother's in a panic. My son, my son. So he says it again and again, Mom, Dad, talk to Dad. And the father came on the line quickly got a grasp of where exactly Ahmed was in a ditch at the front entrance, at the gate, realized he has relatives who live close by, tells his son, put your vest underneath you to stanch the blood. He did that, Ahmed did that, just before he lost consciousness, and he was saved. The relatives came, they put his broken body on a body bag. He woke up, saw the body bag, said, no, I'm alive, I'm alive lost consciousness. They got him the five-hour tortuous drive to the emergency hospital center for victims of war that could do surgeries, these wonderful Italian doctors. They repaired him. And when I met him, he was the only one left out of the 91 patients who'd been brought from Kunduz to um, the Kabul hospital. And it was uh, over a month later. And I have O negative blood, so they're always glad to see me, because if I donate blood, they can use it in different ways. So I finished donating the blood, and I said, hey, is there anybody in the hospital here still from Kunduz? And the Italian doctors and nurses said, oh, Laura, yeah, he's so lonely. Yeah. And they, they knew I was with my young Afghan friends, and so they translated. And that's how I got this story. But then Ahmed is kind of like, well, so who's she? And they told him I was from the United States. And then, you know, he, he had an internal catheter and an IV, and he had um, become quite sallow and very, very thin. You could see his ribs. He could only walk with assistance, but he was a survivor. And maybe he had some survivor's guilt. Forty-three people were killed that day. And of them, 12 were his colleagues, and three were medical doctors. And so he looked at me from the United States, and he asked, why did your people want to do this to us? We were only trying to help people. And then he repeated it. Why did your people want to do this to us? We were only trying to help people. 
We can't always have answers. But there's a bit of a green light. Because Saudi Arabia, that was October 6th. By October 27th, the Saudis had bombed a Doctors Without Borders hospital in Yemen. In fact, they've done it four times now. And in Syria, people have been bombing hospitals. And so here's Yemen, and Saudi Arabia is above. And Yemen is the poorest country in the Arab Peninsula. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. They're suffering from cholera and conflict-driven famine possibilities. And still, the Saudis have been bombing Yemen relentlessly and subjecting it to a state of siege. And many of us saw this same terrible reality play itself out in Iraq. And so, can despair, can despair drive people toward making the changes that are needed to build a better world? I believe that's possible. I believe it's possible. I've been to Egypt, that's it. Um, my friend, Meta Sabia Rigby, is from Ethiopia, and we were together looking, trying to figure out, so okay, 15% of the world's refugees are going into European countries, where are the other 85% going? And Sabia's looking at the map, and she said, Kathy, they're going, a lot, a lot of them are going to Yemen. And I, thinking I know everything, said, oh, Sabia, come on, that can't be right. Whoa! In 2016, the United States took in hmm, 80,000 refugees. This year, we're taking in 30,000. Yemen, that same year, took in 117,000 refugees and 225,000 Somalis were living there. Why are so many people from Africa trying to go to Yemen of all places? Because along what's called the line of colonization going across Africa, the desertification caused in large part by northern greenhouse gases, white people's pollution. Along that line, people's Crops are failing, their livestock are thirsting. People go across that landscape and they see the burst bodies of the livestock and they're filled with plastic because that's all there was to eat. And so people are desperate and they can't any longer get out through Libya because we bombed the daylights and wrecked that country. And so they think, well, maybe over to the Red Sea and up. And it's so, so dangerous. The crossings are terrible. Chaos and exploitation sets in, and it sets in in very, very ugly ways, detention and torture and extortion. But I'll tell you, the most dangerous crossings are when President Trump and Speaker of the House Ryan and Congress people and senators cross over to Saudi Arabia and dance with the princes and welcome the prince to come over here on the royal show, meet with Oprah, Meet with the Hollywood people. Open up your movie theaters. Build us a Disneyland. Those are the dangerous crossings because that's when Lockheed Martin and Boeing and Raytheon and General Dynamics sell the weapons that tear the children apart. They sell the weapons that tear the children apart. 34 kids are just going out on their field trip. They're on the bus. How are kids on a bus on a field trip? You all know. They're squirmy, they're laughing, they're jostling, they're poking. They're going on a field trip, they're so excited, they've each been given a blue backpack. And when you get a UNICEF blue backpack, inside it are vaccines and antibiotics that you can bring home. They're so excited. And with United States surveillance, and with a Lockheed Martin manufactured 500 pound bomb, the Saudis hit that bus and 34 children were killed. And you know, we didn't know how many were killed at first, because for the EMT workers, can you imagine? They're assembling the body parts. They don't really know what goes with what. So my friends, we'll help you get the 34 book bags. You can get them from Dollar Days for $5 a piece. And set those book bags up on your campus and say to people, we're holding this vigil with 34 royal blue backpacks. You know, put two cans of soup and some newspaper inside of them, and we'll give you the placards, we'll give you the names of each child, and just have that presence on your campus and say, we'd like to take a day to remember those 34 children. But we have to try to remember the children 
Some of us went back and forth to Iraq many, many times, and it was because over 500,000 children under age five had died in Iraq because of economic sanctions. My skin is so white I look like Casper the Friendly Ghost. Have I, have I any right to go over to Iraq and sit in the bed with a woman cradling her dying infant who looks like a wizened old man? Well, the truth was, NPR told us, we're never going to cover that story. We're never going to be dupes of Saddam Hussein. You're never going to co you're never going to go in a hospital. Those hospital wards are like death rows for infants. You're never going to go in and talk to a mother or see the conditions. So ordinary, plain people who said, we're going to break that law, ended up going over there. By whose agency? By our own. We just said to the United States government, we're going to break that law as often as we can. And we did. And the US government said, you do that, you risk 12 years in prison, a $1 million fine, a $250,000 administrative penalty. We thanked them for the clarity of the warning. We said that we wouldn't be governed by unjust laws and we invited them to join us. So I didn't go over to Iraq because I thought I could be the great white hope and help save the dying babies. I went over to Iraq to break the law. And I broke that law 27 times and I'm glad I did it. And I'm not only an ex-con, I'm a tax deadbeat. I can't give them money, I just can't. If the mafia knocked on my door, I couldn't say, oh yeah, how much do you want? I just couldn't, I wouldn't, most of you wouldn't. Am I gonna give money to the group that is preparing for the end of the world with our nuclear arsenal, that is selling enough weapons to people in war zones all around the world. I mean, Pope Francis said it so well. He said it in a question, why would anyone give money to people who will use it for weapons? And he then said, and he's addressing the US Congress, he then said the answer is simple. The answer is money. And the money, it is drenched in blood. I do not recommend that you become a war tax refuser. Do not do this. <laughs> Don't do it. But I've been really lucky in my life. I've been able to keep my salary beneath the taxable income and to go through my adult life since 1980 without paying money to the United States government in terms of federal income tax. And so it was a small thing that I could do. ISIS in Afghanistan is sometimes called ISKP, Islamic State of the Khorasan Province. And their attacks have been hideous. They recently claimed responsibility for attacking a place where kids go because they want to get into university and they take courses at 6.30 in the morning and 69 were killed and so many more wounded. And our good friend Gulumai, somebody Doug and I know well, was in the place at the time, badly traumatized. And so the young people the next day on a phone call were saying, I don't believe in nonviolence anymore. Not the ones we've known for years and years, but new ones who had come to the center looking for answers. Maybe this will seem terribly roundabout, but I was in Iraq at a point when United States soldiers were going up and down the buildings on Haifa Street and just pulling people in to this prison called the Book of Compound. And they didn't know anything about the people except that maybe they were third country nationals, TCNs. And if you were at TCN and you got picked up by the military, you ended up south of Basra in what to me was the worst place in the world I've ever been in. We were spitting flies out of our mouth. The sand was covered with oil, 120 to 140 degrees. There's no real prison. There were tents and tarps and no roads. It was so hideous. And these kids, these teenagers had begged me, can you find our friends, we were released from there, but our friends are still there. And we said, mm -hmm. so God bless Major Garrity from Nashville, Tennessee. She heard our pleas and she said, okay, I'm gonna let you go into the prison. So bump, 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 there's no road, right? We're in this pickup truck and we, oh, the reunion between the dentist and his brother. And then their stories corroborated what the kids who were released said, that they had to bark like dogs to get their food. 
and say, I love President Bush. Because it was one horrible story after another. All right, Ali Baghdadi founded ISIS. He spent five years in that camp I just described. So what got ISIS going? United States war, imprisonment, torture, disrespect for human beings, violation of basic humanitarian law. Does that justify what ISIS and what ISKP did to Gulamai and his friends that were killed in Afghanistan? Oh, of course not. But do we think that more weapons and more explosions and more torture and more bludgeoning is going to create People who say, oh, I believe in nonviolence. I just saw it on that phone call. Everybody in Afghanistan, every family practically now has a gun. And what kind of a bloodletting is going to happen if all of those people start picking up their guns and shooting at each other? And who's going to benefit? The United States will say, oh, those people need us to put order in place. And what's underneath the Hindu Kush mountains? The stuff we use in our cell phones and our computers, the lithium, the beryllium, the rare earth minerals. And the United States does not want to let go of that. And so if people kill each other off in Afghanistan, well, it happened during the Iran-Iraq war, didn't it? And Henry Kissinger said things couldn't be better. They're killing each other and using our weapons to do it. So we must not think to ourselves that more guns and more weapons and more firepower and more violence is going to create peace. That doesn't make rational sense. And there can be no rational discussion of problem solving in our world today without first discussing how to dismantle the worst warlord on the planet and in history, and that's the United States military.